Simon, take it Cheers. away. Thanks, Gregor. Sure. So this next bit will go through some high availability um, features that you can do in Azure. Some of them you might already be familiar with in terms of load balances and bits and pieces in, in traditional like HA appliances. Think of it like with firewalls. Uh, so yeah, what you can do is Azure provides you with a list of options. These uh, can start with uh, load balances, which is traditional. So you'd have your two virtual machines that you can route your traffic through if one is being updated. Alongside that, once you've got your load balancer in place, you can then have scale sets, which put three instances of the same virtual machine within different racks within the data center. So if there was a rack failure, uh, your application would still stay online and active uh, while that rack was having maintenance performed on. Uh, then next you have um, availability sets. So this is from a regional perspective. So for every Azure region, there are three data centers which build a region. And so the availability sets will cover you if there is a, a total loss in, in data center. Uh, please bear in mind that this is not an alternative for backup. You should also make sure that your workloads and data sets are backed up to a recovery service vault, but this just covers you for the uptime and running performance of your workloads within the public cloud. Can we have the next slide, Greg, please? Cool. So uh, for reliability and predictability, uh, there are some things that you can do in terms of like internal monitoring. Uh, there's a, a product called Azure Monitor, which allows you to look at the metrics and just ensure that your workloads are running all fine and happy. Uh, same again with being cost effective in, in the public cloud, as we've already mentioned, as, as Lisa said at the beginning. It gives you the ability to scale up and scale down those workloads. Some of this can be automated, so you can have it scale up if there is an increase in workload, and then you can scale down those workloads as well, which touches on the point we made from a, a hybrid cloud perspective. It might be that you have your, your traditional rack full of servers in your private data center, but then there's some workloads that you want to outsource to the public cloud because you can make use of those extra compute resources from Microsoft or Amazon or AWS. So you can scale up for a short period of time to run those workloads if you were doing data processing. And then once that's completed, you can then scale them back down. Same again for, for reduced downtime, obviously using the public cloud. Uh, they have data centers and teams of people on site monitoring this in real time. So the uptime will be better than your private data center where you might have to wait on a hardware vendor to send you a replacement part or a replacement server, which could potentially take days or weeks, depending on what SLA contract that, that, that you've got with them. And it's the same with the support as well. So there's, there's teams of Microsoft support engineers online and premier support agents that you can speak to. So if there is a problem, you can create a support ticket within Azure to help them to help you work out what the connectivity issues or the problems are within your application. Can we have the next slide, please? So security and governance. This is obviously a hot topic and will be, I think, for, for the foreseeable future. Uh, obviously, Azure provides encryption for all services within Azure. There are obviously ways that you can make it more secure, uh, which we'll cover in a latest series. But yeah, the points to make here is that all the data is encrypted at rest for, for virtual machines and for your backups. If you're wanting your applications, though, to talk just solely to those in applications and not run over the Azure backbone, you can deploy services called private endpoints, which basically means that only the resources within the virtual network are able to talk to each other. Cool. Can we have the next slide, please? So for manageability of the cloud, um, there are obviously various different ways that you can orchestrate your workloads through Azure. Um, some of them are, the, the easiest one would be starting with the Azure portal. Uh, this is obviously the web portal that you'll log into with your Microsoft account. Uh, you can then also use uh, the Windows PowerShell application or Azure command line interface or AZCLI, which allows you to run command line operations to be able to orchestrate 
your workloads. What we have found is that there are some things that you can do better in Azure through the command line and that you can't always find all the options for in, in the portal. If you were wanting to look at, say, automating your workload, you can use ARM templates, which is basically infrastructure as code, which you can then deploy your workloads straight into Azure. Cool. Can we have the next slide, please, Gregor? Thank you very much. Thanks. So for scalability, as, as we've already touched on, uh, you can scale up your workloads but automatically or manually. Uh, you can also create monitoring around that using automation alerts. So if you see a sudden influx in, uh, say, a virtual machine CPU or memory, you can have triggers to automatically scale that up or scale that down, uh, which then ties into cost savings um, so that if the workloads aren't running, you can either shut down the virtual machines or uh, you can have them turn off. And then using automation, you can turn them on in the morning before everyone gets into work. I have one quick question, Simon. I think we had a few more slides here. Is that true? Yeah, we did. I think I could try because I think I have the recent uh, slides. So I uh -huh. could try and share the screen and see if that works. But I haven't tried it before. So people can go for it. Uh, Bear it's with like me. a live demo. <laughs> it is always like that, you know? It's never how we expect it to be. So give me one second. Let's see if I can make this happen for you. Now I'm going to try and share. Are you seeing my slides? I think so. I'm seeing a set of slides. Yeah. I think... Yeah, then if you go to the next, yeah, there we go. Cool, cool, cool. Do you want to talk yep. about, the, is this where you were? Yep, that was exactly where I was getting up to and went, that doesn't match what I've got on my slide deck in front of me. But no worries, fine. I got your back. Thank you, Lisa. That's why we're yes. friends. <laughs> we're just throwing my curveball. We like a curveball from time to time. <laughs> oh, there's nothing like throwing you off on a live presentation. That's fine. So going back to security and governance then, uh, when you've got your on-premise environment, you've obviously got like, antivirus products installed on your servers and endpoints um defender of cloud is basically the cloud the cloud equivalent of that and um, so what this screenshot shows you is the services that microsoft give you from defender for cloud you can turn these on and off based on whether you're running the workloads uh, you can also automate this so if you deploy a virtual machine it can integrate into defender for cloud it can install all your endpoint management and start scanning to make sure that all your workloads are protected as you can see from, from the breakdown here, there's uh, so there's uh, 10 services currently provided, all with different costings, and there's different tiers, as you can see, for servers. I would say if you could click on the change plan, but you can't as it's a screenshot, there's basically two tiers that you can choose from. So there's plan two, which is like the full, you get everything, uh, which gives you real-time monitoring, scanning, updating, and some other bits and pieces. And then there's a, a plan one, which is slightly cheaper, which gives you less services. This is a very much, it's an all or nothing policy. So you can't exclude certain services. You basically turn this on from the top of your subscription and it will enroll all servers or any uh, application or cloud service that you're using. Uh, it's a question that we get asked by customers loads of times going, well, we only want this to be enabled on certain machines. And we're like, it, you can't have it like, like that. It's very much a an all or nothing policy. Uh, and yes, as, as, as Gregor says, uh, please turn it on. It will save you a load of headache down the line. Uh, and it also ties into the next slide, which is for Azure policy. So if I can ask one question, Simon. Of course. If I'm really new to Azure and I don't really know what Defender for Cloud is, could you yep. describe in one sentence why I should definitely, definitely enable Defender for Cloud? Uh, because it will make your life a lot easier and you'll be able to sleep happier at night knowing that all your <laughs> workloads are protected. Uh, and it does real-time scanning. So should uh, one of your workloads or services or applications get attacked, is it, it happens nowadays, unfortunately. That mm -hmm. is the world that we live in. Uh, this will give you real-time monitoring and alerting to tell you exactly what's happening, where it's happening from, and what's happened within the virtual machine, for example. That um, sounds pretty cool, but would it also act for me immediately when something happens? It can do, yeah. 
Uh, so if someone tries to deploy malware onto a server, for example, uh, I'm only using this as a use case as it almost happened to a customer of ours last week. Oh. There was a, it, it, it turned out in the end, it was a, it was a pen test by an external company, mm -hmm. but Defender for Cloud basically did its thing. It, it flags a load of uh, malicious activity on the virtual machine of someone trying to be a threat actor and get into mm -hmm. the virtual machine. It then said that they managed to get in and they tried to execute a payload and Defender for Cloud did its exact thing of going, hey, this doesn't look like normal activity, logged it all, caught the file before it got executed and then quarantined it and sent an email um, to the customer going, hey, we've noticed this, uh, you might want to go check it out. Oh, that would really help me sleep better at night for sure. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. All also, right. Also, just before we move on, like looping back to uh, saying that if you're new to the cloud, having Defender will also kind of do analysis of kind of your configurations. So if you yeah. accidentally leave uh, your RDP port, so remote desktop open to the whole internet, it will flag that as well. So it's quite useful for uh, picking up potential configuration mistakes uh, you know, before, uh, before, you know, sort of things get too out of hand. Cool. Cool. Uh, which, uh, it, that's a really nice point that you made, Matt, about being able to catch things. And this is exactly what Azure Advisor does for you. Uh, it basically advises you for best practice within your subscription. Uh, and as, as Matt just mentioned, if you have left RDP open to the world by accident, uh, it will tell you. It will also tell you on the network security group, it puts a little yellow triangle next to it to warn you going, hey, this shouldn't be allowed out. You should have either locked down to an external IP address or have a, a VPN connection or use um, Azure Bastion, which is basically like a console window straight in from your browser page. Uh, so yeah, the Azure Advisor is always a good place to start. We have many meetings internally with customers to go through this and go, hey, your Azure Advisory score is say 60% and it tells you it ranks them from high, medium, and low and gives you some best practice recommendations. Uh, I would definitely say if you have an Azure environment, go have a look through this and you will find lots of things uh, that it recommends you to use. Uh, the caveat I would say to this is obviously don't enable it all at once because it may not all be right for your environment. It's just following the Microsoft best practice, uh, which sometimes if you do enable this, it will, uh, yeah, it could potentially break your production workload. So yeah, I would always say, check out what the recommendation is first and go away and read the, the Microsoft docs before you implement this in production, just to cover that. But yeah, there's lots of useful information within the Azure Advisory page that can help you get, get started in securing your environment. So let's say I'm new again to starting to learn Azure. What is really the difference between Azure Advisor and Azure Defender for Cloud? So Azure Advisor is for the whole of your subscription. So it'll tell you about everything from storage accounts to SQL to AKS to, to pretty much everything within the, the, the environment, whereas Defender for Cloud is more like the security and antivirus side of, of Azure to ensure that the workloads are kept secure. So Azure Advisor will tell you, say, how to secure your environment, whereas Azure Defender will say, hey, someone's tried to get into your VM or we've noticed some malicious activity from some IP address in the world that we don't recognize and we think you should check out. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. And for the people that are like, hey, I don't even know what subscriptions are at this point. What is a subscription? What is a resource group? That will be covered in the next week, I think. So stay tuned for that as well. Shall I go to the next slide? Yeah, please. I will try to do that. Am I going the right way, Simon? Yep, you're going the right way. I think, yeah, can we jump to the next slide? Of course, whatever you Lovely. say. <laughs> Cheers, <laughs> thanks, Lisa. So yeah, just, just to touch on this page, as we've already partially covered it, these are, yeah, the ways that, that, that you can measure your, your Azure environment. So you can either do it through, through the portal, which is all, yeah, manually clicking around and, and, and deploying resources, or, or you can automate it uh, using PowerShell or ATCLI. Uh, I know Gregor has a very much love-hate relationship with ARM templates and is trying to move us all over to using Bicep, which uh, won't get 
covered in the exam, but effectively arm and bicep are infrastructure code languages, which allows you to automate your, your environment deployment. So from like a single command, you can stand up a whole enterprise environment, uh, walk away and come back within a couple of hours and be production ready to go. Next page, please. Thank you very much. So Azure policy, uh, it, it ties in along with the whole governance and compliancy thing and is great for if you're wanting to cost save as one of the examples is shown here. Uh, using Azure policy, you can basically restrict what virtual machines, SKUs or database sizes that you, that you can deploy. So if you have a development team, for example, that you only want to deploy a certain set of resources and to a certain set of resource groups, you can do this all through Azure policy. You can also use this to automate backups. So we have a customer that I was doing some work on recently where they wanted to change how their Azure backups work. So they wanted to be able to tag a virtual machine if they didn't want to have it automatically enrolled into their backup plan. So we edited the policy to basically say if they have a virtual machine tagged with exclude from backup, it would then not automatically enroll it into the recovery service vault. So yeah, I think the, the takeaway from this slide would be that Azure policy is a really powerful tool that you can use for monitoring and alerting in terms of if things are non-compliant, uh, you can get it to alert and then send you an email to say, hey, this virtual machine has been up for say 30 days and is missing some security patches. Uh, we need to let our support team know that this machine needs to be booked in for maintenance window to be rebooted. Can I also use Azure policy to even block deployment of resources or maybe even the deletion of resources if I wanted to? Yes, you can do. Uh, you can have it either exclude certain resources. So if you're not wanting to bankrupt your company because there are some resources that will cost you a lot of money, uh, you can basically exclude those and say, yeah, these people aren't allowed to deploy this. And the, yeah, the same as you say, if you want to be, ensure that certain resources aren't deleted, uh, you can use something called resource locks and you can create a policy that says that for anything that gets deployed by this user or to these resource groups, uh, we want to automatically protect so there's no accidental remove deletion of production workloads. I think that would really suck if that were to happen. Something like yep. accidentally getting deleted, you never want that to happen, of course. Nope. So good to know. Thank you. Yeah. And just on that point as well, for every resource group that you've got, there's an activity log. So should someone accidentally delete something, you will know exactly at what time, where and when and which user did it. So yeah, in terms of audit trails, you can you can find all of that. So yeah. Very cool. Just be careful. <laughs> be careful out there. Yeah. So for automation, uh, we all want to make our lives easier and using automation accounts is a great way to do that. Uh, probably the best example I could give is from a, a virtual machine perspective, uh, partly because that's from my background and because for the most of the customers that I deal with, they're, they're all still very much virtual machine based. So from a cost saving perspective, as, as we've said already, if you don't want to buy into the, the reservation route, you can save some money by stopping your virtual machines outside of business hours because you only pay for the compute resource while it's on and running. If it's stopped and deallocated, you only pay for the storage costs of the, the data running within the data center. So if your business only runs from say 9 a.m. till 5 a.m. Monday to Friday, you could then say from six o'clock in the evening till six o'clock in the morning or seven o'clock in the morning, we want to deallocate these virtual machines so we're not paying for the compute time as we don't need them, them running because no one's going to work on them out of hours. And it's the same for uh, patching those virtual machines. Uh, you can do that automatically through an automation account using update management. And you can basically ensure that all your virtual machines are kept up to date and compliant with the latest Microsoft patches and releases. And it can all be automated and you can set it up with email notifications so you know when they've been automated, patched, rebooted and come back up. So that's it. Have we got any questions? I don't see them in the chat right now, but I know that I missed some the last time. So Matt, could you please verify that this is true? <laughs> I, I don't think there's any any questions that haven't been answered. So I think we're all good. 
I think we were cool. just really clear on things.